Now most of us know that the Norse sailed to Iceland and Greenland, set up shop for a while and thrived. But did you know that on the way there they had some pretty amazing stories? For example, when they first got to Iceland they claimed there were a bunch of Irishmen already there, Irish monks to be specific, and they'd already set up shop. And when they went further west, they found a place called Great Ireland, they referred to it as, or Hintravanaland. And this land, it kind of exists in this cusp between legend and history. It's a pretty interesting story, and so you know what, go grab your parka, let's go to the Great White North and check out Hintravanaland. Hi, I'm Dan, and welcome to Dedunking. Now, the Norse accounts are considered fairly reliable, but we have a few other things that reference it as well. For example, the Irish have a story called Imrama, which is basically a mingling of Christianity and Old Irish mythology. And in that, they speak of traveling to the Irish underworld by sea. And the Celts did believe that the Irish underworld was far to the west of where they lived, so it does kind of track that that's the direction that they would go. King Arthur was said to have sent people there to settle the land, and five generations later one of them came back to the mainland, about 14th century. Mercator records this actually in his 16th century polar map, and it's weird little mingling like I was saying earlier, this kind of cusp in between science and, and myth right here, where it, it speaks of them having magic, but it's on the scientific map, it's very much you know a product of methodical thinking, but it's also off in the weeds with all these legends and myths and stuff, it's really... Again, it's this kind of interesting time in history to look at. The first time the Vikings rode of Great Ireland was in the 10th century. A man named Ari Marson traveled six days west of Ireland and found this place eventually. The locals supposedly recognized him, and um, it's kind of a weird thing because they like baptized him and they wouldn't let him go. He had some sort of problem leaving. He's not very specific, but he was baptized by the locals. This is the earliest account we see of them using the term Great Ireland or White Man's Land, Hintramanaland being White Man's Land in Norse. So hang on, this is not some Elysium paradise for people of questionable intelligence and even more questionable moral character. This is a description of the inhabitants. The super duper white Norse thought these guys were super duper duper white, which means they probably just couldn't dance. About 40 years later, another Norseman, Gudlif Gudlifsson, apparently went to the same place when he was blown off course. The people there seemed to speak Irish and they took them captive and it looked like they were going to be killed or maybe sold into slavery or something, but then another Norseman came and intervened. This Norseman let all these other guys go and they didn't really know who they'd met at the time, but later on they decided that the guy's name was Bjorn Asbranded Son Boldavik Champion. I guess he was some big ass branded guy from back in the day. I'm not really sure what's all up with that. It doesn't say a whole lot about it, but apparently he was a famous exiled Viking dude. But the thing is, it doesn't say specifically in this account that this is the Hintamanaland, but it does like talk about Irish people being there on this land that was blown off course in that direction. So it's generally considered to be a reference to it. Now the next account comes from the Annals of Greenland in the 11th century. It speaks of a place near the shores of Vinland, which is part of North America, according to Eric the Red. And it, this place is also called Hintavanaland, uh, the land of the white folk or whatever you want to call it. But it was also called Albania, and it was implied that this is a land of albinos. So this does give us an idea that these people were considered to be extremely, extremely light skinned, light hair even in some of the descriptions. Well, the saga of Eric the Red also contains a reference to Hintravanalan. In this one, um, Eric the Red and his men show up on this land that they were blown off course to. They find five natives, one bearded guy, two women, and two children. The man and the two women have escaped into a hole in the ground, but they capture the two kids. After a while, they get some information from the kids, and one of the things they say is a neighboring land to them is the Hintravanalan, and in that land, there's people with white coats that are frilly white coats, and they long, long poles for weapons. And uh, that's basically the long and short of the Viking accounts. There's really not a whole lot said about it. It's specifics except for, like, here's where it is, here's what we saw, here's where it is, here's what we saw. It's extremely, like I said, extremely tantalizing and right on that cusp of mystery, history, eh, legend. Eh. Now there are several artifacts in North America that are said to be of Norse origin, and the Dighton Rock is one that plays right into this story. In the 19th century, Carl Christian Roffen came up with a translation that basically spoke of bearded men wielding tools of iron from a Native American perspective. And he believed that these same tools of iron basically were the same long poles that were used by these other people in the Hintravanalan story from the two children that were captured by Eric the Red. 
Now, there's a lot of translations regarding the Dighton Rock, and this, the one that he made has actually been called an outright forgery by some. And my next video is for patrons only, but it's going to be covering the Dighton Rock and its many translations and the pseudo-archaeology and pseudoscience surrounding it, and if there is uh, any actual reality to any of this stuff. And uh, for $2 a month, you can get into my Patreon and watch my uh, videos that are out there. There's a couple of videos about this length and a couple of shorts each month. And um, anyway, links down below. Now, as for Hintramandalon, it kind of seems to disappear from history at that point. We don't see any more references to it besides just a couple of passing ones mentioning it. And even alternate historians nowadays don't really talk about it a whole lot. We, we do have a few people that do like to talk about it, but by and large, it's been forgotten. A 1998 book has about the most fleshed out hypothesis I could find on this whole mess, The Farfarers Before the Norse by Farley Moad. In it he details how his hypothesis is that the Irish were displaced at the end of the Roman times with the war and turmoil from there and that they fled to Iceland. Except he doesn't believe that these were actually Irish, he believes that they were the Albans, a different tribe, and that these people later on were displaced when the Norse started to show up to Iceland forcing them to travel out even further. Also, he believes they were heavily into ivory trade, which also caused them to explore. And if the Albans did indeed settle all around the region, it would explain why the Norse claimed that they bumped into Irish over and over again, if the Albans and the Irish were similar, which they were both Celtic tribes from the same region, so it stands to reason they would be mistakable for each other. And that really makes this story very interesting. It's like, there's not a lot of evidence for his position. There's almost none. So it's like most archaeologists and historians don't actually accept that these people were the Albans. But it's still the kind of thing that they, they, they're not going to attack like they attack like Graham Hancock or something because this is just, it's just speculative history with, with you know, it's, it's not getting out into the weeds crazily. It's just, maybe this is how this came to be. It's, it's kind of like looking for the lost colony of Roanoke without invoking spaceships, right? So... This is exactly the sort of mystery I love. It's it's like it, right in that twilight zone between between real and fake and between legend and real and, and, and history. And it's just, it's a thing of beauty. It's the kind of thing you could imagine about for hours and still have some real touchstones to go to to inform your imagination. So it makes it basically exactly the kind of thing that I cover on this channel. So if you enjoy this, this is the place for you. Click buttons down below and we will see you next time. Thank you. There was a man named Goodleaf, the son of Goodloff the wealthy of Streamfirth, the brother of Thorfinn, from whom are come the Stirlings. Goodleaf was much of a seafarer, and he owned a big ship of burden, and Thorolf, the son of Loft of Thur, owned another, when as they fought with Gerd, son of Earl Sigvaldi, at which fight Gerd lost his eye. But late in the days of King Olaf the Holy, Goodleaf went a merchant voyage west to Dublin, and when he sailed from the west he was minded for Iceland, and he sailed round Ireland by the west and fell in with gales from the east and northeast, and so drove a long way west into the main and southwestern withal, so that they saw naught of land, and by then the summer pretty far spent, therefore they made many vows that they might escape from out of the main. But so it befell at last that they were ware of land, a great land it was, but they knew not what land. Then such reed took Goodleaf and his crew that they should sail unto land, for they thought it ill to have to do any more with the main sea, so then they got them good haven. And when they had been there a little while, men came to meet them whereof none knew aught, though they deemed somewhat they spake in the earth's tongue, that's Irish. At last they came in such throngs that they made many hundreds, and they laid hands on them all and bound them, and drove them up into the country, and they were brought to a certain moat and were doomed thereat. At this they came to know that some would they have been slain, and others that they should be allotted to their country folk and be slaves. And so, while these matters are in debate, they see a company of some men come riding, and a banner borne over the company, and it seemed to them that they might be some great man amongst these. And so, as the company drew nigh, they saw under the banner a man riding, big and like a great chief of aspect, but stricken in years, and hoary withal. And all who were there before worshipped that man, and greeting him as their lord, and soon they found all counsels and awards were brought whereas he was. So this man sent for Goodleaf and his folk, and when as they came before him, he spake to them in the tongue of the Northmen, and asked whence lands they were. They said they were Icelanders for the more part. So the man asked who the Icelanders might be. Then Goodleaf stood before the man, and greeted him in worthy wise, and he took his greeting well, and asked whence of Iceland he was. And he told him of Bugfirth. Then he asked whence of Bugfirth he was, and Goodleaf told him. After that, he asked him closely concerning each and all of the mightiest men in Bugfirth and Broadfirth, and amidst his speech he asked concerning Snorri the priest and his sister Thurid the Frodiswater, and most of all the youngling Kiartan, who in those days was gotten to be a goodman of Frodiswater.
But now meanwhile the folk of the land were crying out in another place that some counsel should be taken concerning the ship's crew. So the big man went away from them and called him by name twelve of his own men, and they sat a long while talking and thereafter went to the man moat. Then the big man said to Goodleaf and his folk, We people of the country have talked your matter over somewhat, and they have given the whole thing over to my ruling, and I for the most part will give you leave to go your ways with ever soever ye will. And though ye may well deem that the summer wears late now, yet I will counsel you to get gone hence, for there dwelleth here a folk untrustworthy and ill to deal with, and they deem their laws to already be broken of you. Goodleaf says, What shall we say concerning this, if it befall us to come back to the land of our kin, as to who has given us our freedom? He answered, That I will not tell you, for I should be ill content for any of my kin or froster brother, and should make such a voyage hither as ye have made. Had I not been here for your avail, and now withal, says he, my days have come so far that on any day it may be looked at, the eld shall stride over my head. Yea, and though I live yet a while, yet there are many mightier men than I, who will have little will to give peace to outland men, albeit they not be abiding nearby whereas ye have now come. Then this man let make their ship ready for sea, and abode them with till the wind was fair for sailing, and or ever he and Goodleaf parted. He drew a gold ring from off his arm, and gave it into Goodleaf's hand, and therewithal a good sword, and he spake to Goodleaf, If it befall thee to come back to thy foster land, thou shalt deliver this sword to Kiartan, the goodman at Frodiswater, but the ring to Thurid his mother. Then said Goodleaf, And what shall we say concerning the sender of these good things to them? He answered, Say that he sends them who was a greater friend of the good wife of Frodus Water than of the priest of Holyfell, her brother. But, and if any shall deem that they know thereby who owned these fair things, tell them that my word is with all, that I forbid one and all to go seek me, for this land lacks all peace, unless to such that it may befall them to come a land in such a lucky wise as ye have done, the land also is wide, and harbors are ill to find therein, and in all places trouble and war await outland men, unless it befall them as it has now befallen you. Thereafter they departed, Goodleaf and his men put to sea and made Ireland in the late autumn, and abode in Dublin throughout the winter. But the next summer Goodleaf sailed to Iceland and delivered the goodly gifts there, and all men held it for true that this must have been Bjorn the Broadwick champion, but no other true token have men thereof other than these even now told.